Welcome to today's annual BakerBots webinar, the U.S. Supreme Court's impact on patent rights. Thanks for joining us today, and we are looking forward to an exciting program. So our participants will be myself, Michael Hawes. Um, I'm a partner in our intellectual property practice here at BakerBots, and I clerked for Judge William Bryson on the Federal Circuit before coming here, and my colleague and partner Jennifer Nall, also in our intellectual property practice, clerked for fellow Federal Circuit Judge Timothy Dyke. Uh, Jennifer and I get to watch our court's stellar track record at the Supreme Court as part of this, but I always think without circuit splits, they take the cases when they do have questions. So. I'll try to confirm that, though, with my partner, Aaron Street, who's the chairman of our Supreme Court and constitutional law practice here at Baker Botts. Aaron clerked for Chief Justice William Rehnquist at the United States Supreme Court and has insight on how the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court are getting along these days. So we're going to go through, obviously, the term we've had, the three big cases. And then we're going to turn to the October 2018 upcoming term and look at what's already on the docket. And we had a new one this morning that hopefully we'll have a chance to let you know about. And finally, kind of what some of the trends are, especially with Section 101 cases. So I'll turn it over to Aaron. But let's start out with the CLE. Obviously, if there are questions during the presentation, uh, please email Sarah Carpenter. Her email address is sara dot carpenter c a r p e n t e r at bakerbots dot com, and Sarah can pass those on to us so we can answer them for you. This program has been approved for CLE credit in Texas and California for one hour of participatory credit, and in New York for one hour of transitional and non-transitional credit. I will read a CLE verification code towards the end of the program, and you will need to include the verification code on the CLE affirmation form that you received with this program's reminder. And we'll also send an evaluation form after the webinar. A recording of the webinar will be circulated in the next few days, and we'll also post it to our firm website at www.bakerbots.com. So Aaron, can you start us off with a brief overview of the October 2017 term? You bet. You see on your screen some of the main players at the court this term, three of them justices, and one, not a justice, but had a great effect on the court through his appointment of uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch, and that's, of course, President Trump. This term uh, was Justice Gorsuch's first full term at the court, and we saw the incredible impact that the Republicans' decision to hold open the Scalia seat had on a number of cases that probably would have come out differently if Merrick Garland had been confirmed as a justice at the end of President Obama's term. Uh, we also learned a lot more about Justice Gorsuch. Uh, for our purposes, he wrote opinions in all three of the patent cases that were decided this term, so he has an interest in that area of the law. Uh, he also revealed himself to be a full-fledged originalist, someone who tries to determine the original public meaning of the Constitution and the textual meaning of statutes, but he has his own unique take on that, a little bit different than Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas. We also were treated to his writing style, which was uh, alternately criticized and praised, but very colloquial, easy to read, and full of literary allusions and, and analogies. And, of course, we uh, should not pass by the big news of yesterday, which was Justice Kennedy announcing his retirement from the court effective July 31st, setting off a confirmation process that will uh, aim to be concluded by the beginning of the next term in October 2018. Uh, we also saw uh, Justice Ginsburg become that rarest of creatures, a justice who is also a celebrity, uh, known as the notorious RBG and, uh, and uh, invading the public sphere with uh, documentary and uh, many public appearances. She is now uh, perhaps one of the most recognizable justices on the court. A couple statistical points to mention before we begin to dive into the patent cases. Uh, this term had the record low number of opinions in the modern era. 
uh, only 62 signed opinions after argument. And after terms in which uh, the five to four decisions went conservative sometimes and liberal other times, this term there were 14 five to four decisions and Justice Kennedy as the swing vote joined with the conservatives in every single case. So this term he returned to his conservative roots before announcing his retirement. So now let's uh, move on with that overview out of the way to the IP decisions of this term and we'll hand it back over to Mike. It's pretty obvious this term that the Supreme Court kind of agrees with the IP practitioners that the big new area, at least in patent law, is the inter partes review. A majority of the IP decisions, now granted that's only two of three, were about IPRs, um, including of course the headline decision of oil states as to whether they ought to exist at all. Um, but let's talk about why IPRs are so important and put in context what the Supreme Court decided. Jennifer, can you give us some uh, idea of why these are so important and the Supreme Court got so concerned about them this year. Happy to. So for background, IPRs are a relatively new process, an administrative agency process where people, third parties, can go to the patent office and ask for a review of the patentability of, of, a, uh, of any patent. And the, one of the interesting things is it doesn't have to be a defendant in a litigation. It can be any entity that just wants to file. So, for example, Unified Patents has been filing against, against patents that have been asserted. And this is very important for defendants in patent litigation because it gives this opportunity that didn't exist before for a relatively high speed decision from the patent office on the patentability of the claims that are asserted by an agency that is not using the same clear and convincing standard of, of review as is being used at the district court and you're not having invalidity determinations by a jury, you're having it done by, in many instances, former federal circuit clerks, uh, people who have been practitioners for many years, uh, former partners of law firms who specialized in patent law, who are looking at these patents and the patentability um, and deciding very quickly about whether or not they should, they should be held in unpatentable. So this next slide is a timeline that was promulgated by the PTO a couple of years ago that shows the, that, that timeline, the, the, the high speed nature of what you can get from an IPR. And so within the first, you file a petition and within the first about six months, you get a petition on, uh, you get a decision on the petition, a decision on institution. And after institution, the PTO, the PTAB will issue a final written decision within 12 months absent special exceptions. And those special exceptions have been found rarely. Um, until oil, until SAS issued, I think that it had happened two or three times total. And it has happened a few more times since SAS, as we'll get into in a few more slides. But basically, the, the takeaway is that if with an IPR, 18 months after you file a petition, actually after you get a uh, filing date of a petition, you, you will get a decision, uh, a final written decision, which can be very helpful if you have a race to, um, to try and invalidate a damages case from a, from a jury decision. So one of the big cases at the Supreme Court, of course, was the oil states case, which challenged the patentability of IPRs. And you probably guessed from the fact that we spent time describing IPRs which way that case came out. But interestingly, the Supreme Court took up another case, one that went to how IPRs should be conducted. So they had one case where they were talking about whether they should be there at all, and another case in which they talked about the details of how they were conducted. I think they actually released the opinions in a non-standard order just so folks would know that IPRs were still around before Justice Gorsuch could tell them how they were going to be conducted. But Oil States is the one about constitutionality. SAS Institute is the one about exactly what, how many of the claims in the petition would be involved. But let's talk about them in a little more detail. So oil states 
was, of course, a case, the reason it got to the Supreme Court was because the plaintiff had done well in the district court, but then had their patent claims declared unpatentable in the IPR. Of course, that's the whole reason they went to the Supreme Court, because if they could overturn that IPR result, then they could go forward with their favorable district court claim construction order. The Federal Circuit didn't agree with their positions, rejected the idea that IPRs were unconstitutional under Article III in the Seventh Amendment, but the Supreme Court gave them another shot when it granted certiorari, and the issue was, are IPRs constitutional under Article III, which is the article that says that only the judicial branch can do certain things, and the Seventh Amendment, which of course gives us our jury trial right in certain situations. Well, as discussed, the Supreme Court did decide with seven of the justices agreeing that it was a constitutional procedure, a constitutional use of Congress's power. Um, key issues in the decision, which was by Justice Thomas, were that the patents are public rights. Uh, they are not, unlike land, they are not granted in perpetuity. They're limited. They're also only granted on certain statutory grounds. And it seemed to be important to the court that the very same rules for patentability are applied in granting a patent as are used in the IPRs. In other words, that the same requirements of novelty and non-obviousness and the same types of prior art are considered before or after. And the court basically said that the only distinction is an irrelevant one, that IPRs occur after the grant as opposed to examination which occurs before. The court paid even less attention to that Seventh Amendment challenge because once the court decided that IPRs could be done by agencies instead of courts, it certainly didn't tell the agencies that they had to impanel a jury. That took them about one paragraph at the end of the opinion. It was a narrow holding and Justice Thomas, as he often does, told us exactly how it's narrow. He told us it doesn't apply to the takings clause and he told us that it doesn't apply to due process. So let's talk a bit about what got rejected. You know, oil states had tried to say, look, patents are private property. There's a lot of language about them being private property. They pointed back to some 18th century English courts and some decisions there. Um, and they also pointed and said, look, IPRs look just like litigation. We should have them in courts. And none of those were convincing to Justice Thomas. He basically looked back at that 18th century law and said, no, look, look at what was happening in some of the judge-only courts that, or judge-only um, committees in the, you know, here you get into the details of English government, but some of the councils in English government that could revoke patents. And certainly just the fact that IPRs looked like litigation didn't require them to be done in courts. Now, there was a concurring opinion, and Aaron, I'll ask you to jump in here because it looked like the concurring opinion wasn't necessarily about patent law at all. That's right, and the concurring opinion was by Justice Breyer, joined by Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor. And their point was simply that the fact that a patent right is a public right was sufficient to take it outside of an Article III court, but they urged the readers not to infer from that that even if the patent right were a private right, uh, that that would necessarily prohibit an agency from adjudicating uh, that type of issue. So Justice Breyer is historically uh, quite deferential to administrative agencies. He has a lot of trust in what he views as the experts within the agencies, and he wants uh, to hold open the possibility that uh, private rights can be adjudicated by other administrative agencies. Uh, interestingly, Justice Kagan did not join that concurrence. Uh, she, in that sense, has followed uh, Chief Justice Roberts' footsteps of not uh, joining separate writings uh, unless she views it as essential. She wants the court to coalesce around the result with a, a larger and uh, um, more justices joining the majority opinion. Also, if you think about it, if she had joined that opinion, there would have been four justices in the concurrence uh, and only three who joined only the majority opinion. So people would argue, well, maybe that's what we should really look at for the meaning of the case. And I think Justice Kagan and the chief are very uh, keen to avoid that sort of outcome. Uh, there is also a dissent by Justice Gorsuch, joined by Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, this illustrated an interesting 
a trend that arose this term. Uh, both Justice Gorsuch's dissent and Justice Thomas's majority opinion employed a, an originalist approach that, as Mike said, looked at what was going on at the time of the founding and how the founders would have considered patents. Uh, but they reached diametrically opposite results. Justice Gorsuch was persuaded by the, what was going on in the 18th century courts uh, hearing patent cases and therefore would have held that they're private property and must be adjudicated by Article III courts. We see this trend playing out in a couple other cases this term where Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch apply the same methodology but reach opposite results and that will be one to keep an eye on. Um, back over to Mike for further comments on the impact of oil states. Well, first, let's, let's start with the, the points that Justice Thomas said weren't really addressed. So Justice Thomas left open for us um, not perhaps compelling issues, but we'll see how it goes. The first one was the takings clause. And here the idea is, well, if, if the government is taking away your patent rights, shouldn't you get some money under the Fifth Amendment that says just compensation? Well, that's a theoretical possibility and some patent lawyers jumped on it. There's a class action that's been filed to try to have all the owners of patents damaged by the IPR proceedings to receive just compensation. But there's some real problems with it. Um, first of all, what is just compensation for a patent claim that should never have been granted? I mean, why, why would it be just for you to get money for something that, frankly, the examiner just got wrong in giving to you in the first place? That's certainly one large hurdle that the plaintiffs are going to have to get over. And another is whether property is taken when the owner had the right to defend. Of course, IPRs allow patentees to present evidence and make arguments with regard to the original standard that allows a patent to even be granted in the first place. There's a tough argument in saying that this has been taken from me when what really happened, as the court already said in the majority opinion about the IPRs themselves, that the same standards are being applied both before and after the grant of the patent. So if you've got a patent and have had some IPRs, IPR take out some of your claims, I wouldn't uh, wait too much with bated breath for a check in the mail from this class action, but we'll keep our eye on it. One of the other things that was reserved, and it's kind of funny the way it was reserved by Justice Thomas, oil states patent was in fact a pre-AIA patent. In other words, it was issued before the Congressional Act that formed IPRs. But what Justice Thomas said was, well, oil states didn't tell us that that was particularly important. So we're not ruling on whether it's particularly important that a patent is a pre-AIA patent. He actually reserved that. There are a number of cases in front of the Federal Circuit right now where patent owners who have pre-AIA patents are now seizing onto that and hoping that they can show that, well, IPRs are unconstitutional for those sorts of patents. Uh, again, probably a pretty big uphill battle. You know, the Federal Circuit's going to get the first shot at this, and of course the Federal Circuit was the one who said IPRs are just constitutional, this isn't a tough issue in the first place. So it seems unlikely they're going to change their stripes after getting affirmed by the Supreme Court. And of course, Justice Thomas, when he talked about the notice the patent owners had, he emphasized ex parte reexamination and that that had given them notice that, you know, their patent rights weren't necessarily unchallengeable. And that's a big deal because there really are no patents that are still not expired but were issued prior to ex parte reexamination, which has been with us since the early 1980s. So it's going to be hard to say these folks did that even for pre-AIA patents, that there wasn't notice that if the patent office determined your patent was unpatentable, you were going to lose it. The last thing the Supreme Court reserved was the due process clause. So that's, of course, that you can't lose rights without due process of law. Now, the due process clause, unlike the attack by oil states, which I guess I would call a hammer trying to just destroy IPRs overall, the due process clause is more of a scalpel. You, you have to identify particular proceedings, particular ways that an IPR that was, was conducted that you can say would, did not comport with due process of law. Now, there were a number of ways that IPRs were, cons were handled in the early days that might have had a shot here. For example, the, the infamous panel packing that the Supreme Court discussed a lot at argument where the PTO changed an IPR from a three-judge panel to a five-judge panel, the two new judges agreeing with the one judge that had ruled in the minority initially to make it a 3-2 decision the other way. 
Well, the Supreme Court didn't seem to take uh, that as a pleasant way of doing a process when, at argument. But we know that, and the PTO has said, they're, they're pretty much not going to do that ever again. So probably not a due process clause, clause challenge we're going to see. There was also rumblings about challenging the amendment standards under the due process clause, but those have become more flexible after the Federal Circuit's Aqua Products case. We should keep in mind that the Administrative Procedure Act is also a protection in that the IPRs are required to comply with the APA. So really a lot of the ways due process might have gotten involved have, have been removed in the last few years. There's still the possibility that the IPRs are conducted with very little discovery. And there are a few ways in which it could be argued that those discovery limits violate due process. But frankly, we're seeing a new PTO these days. There's a big difference between the Obama PTO and the Trump PTO. The new director, Yanku, Director Yanku, seems to be taking away some of the more blatantly uh, favorable procedures for the challengers. So for example, we saw a rule change that the claim construction divide, which allowed challengers of patents and IPRs to use a broader claim construction than used in district court, potentially. That's going to be removed, and, and just the trend seems to be to remove some of these more objection, these procedures that were more subject to an objection. So due process is still out there, but we're going to have to wait and see if there's a procedure that really merits that challenge and it makes it all the way up to the Supreme Court. So if IPRs are still around, I guess we need to decide how they're going to be conducted. And the Supreme Court has decided the case of SAS Institute where they were dealing with the question of how many claims do we have to deal with? And the PTO had decided that, no, we only have to deal with a subset if we think it's only justified. So here's the scenario. A challenger says claims one, two, and three of the patent are invalid. The PTO looks at that and says, well, we think you're right with claim one, but we think you're wrong with claims two and three. If you remember Jennifer showing us those first five or six months when they decide whether to institute, the PTO had said, we can just decide to institute on claim one, but not institute on claims two or three, as we have it up there, a subset of the claims. Well, SAS disagreed. They appealed to the Federal Circuit and said, look, the statute says, in SAS's opinion, you've got to write a written decision on all of the claims challenged. You don't have to institute, but if you do, you got to go after all of them. Well, the Federal Circuit rejected that argument and said, no, the PTO was within its authority to do only a subset of claims. But certiorari was granted, and the Supreme Court took a look at this itself. The issue being, can the PTAB, which is the administrative portion of the Patent and Trademark Office that does IPRs, can they institute IPR proceedings on fewer than all of the claims challenged in the petition? Well, Justice Gorsuch got this one, and he wrote the opinion in a 5-4, kind of a rare occurrence for a patent law case to have that infamous 5-4 split. But it might have been because of the question of how much language, how clear language has to be in order to survive the deference of an agency that wants to do things their way. Justice Gorsuch decided that the text of this statute was clear enough that even though the agency wanted to do a subset of claims, it had to address every claim. So he looked at the language. Of course, the word shall is a, a great word to start with since that doesn't give, sounds like it doesn't give any discretion. And then when it said any claim, Judge Gorsuch said, in this context, any means every. And he decided that the statute's language plainly resolves the question and that the administrative agency has to enforce that clear resolution of the question. So, of course, he rejected the director's arguments. He you know, said partial discretion under other sections didn't mean that this one, that there was any discretion in this section. And of course, pointed to the fact that this section talks about the petition, which he said, guided the IPR, not discretion of the director. And of course, when it came to policy arguments, Justice Gorsuch was not particularly enthusiastic. 
But we have uh, some significant dissents in this one. Again, it's a 5-4. Aaron, what do you think about those dissents? Well, as you see on your screen, we had a dissent from Justice Ginsburg joined by three other members of the liberal bloc. And uh, she focused on uh, a pragmatic argument that uh, the, there's a way to get around this, essentially. Uh, the director could have just exercised his right to deny institutions of the petitions as overly broad. The petitioners could just file a new or amended petition. And thus, it makes a lot more sense just to read the statute the way uh, the PTAB had proposed here. Uh, there's a separate dissent which focuses more specifically on the Chevron issue by Justice Breyer and also joined largely by the other three uh, liberals on the court. And he would have applied Chevron deference here. Uh, this holding is a part of a, an important trend on the court that has only accelerated this term. Of course, under traditional Chevron doctrine, if the statute is ambiguous, then the agency gets to provide an, a reasonable interpretation to fill that gap in the statute. Uh, in recent years, that approach has come under some attack uh, on the grounds that it allows the agency to take over the judicial role of interpreting statutes. Uh, and that would be particularly true if courts are too quick to uh, declare a statute ambiguous. In other words, they don't work too hard before they throw up their hands and say, let's see what the agency thinks. So in this case, uh, Justice Gorsuch's majority opinion seemed to trim back the threshold ambiguity question uh, in a way that is more uh, restrictive of agencies. He said the question is whether the plain meaning is discernible uh, by the courts. So a little tougher standard than uh, clear and unambiguous. In later cases, this term, uh, particularly the Perea immigration case, uh, Justice Gorsuch again wrote the majority opinion, and he said the question is whether the statute is, quote, clear enough, unquote. Uh, then we're not going to defer to the agency. So if this continues, uh, agencies' discretion to interpret statutes will be uh, shrinking over time. Uh, but this will be a question that, that uh, is very much affected by who is confirmed to replace Justice Kennedy. Historically, Justice Kennedy was in the mainstream on Chevron. He had... Uh, uh, generally applied the traditional doctrine, but uh, the rising tide within uh, the conservative Federal Society world is to be more critical of Chevron as uh, an erosion of the separation of powers. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Jennifer. Shortly after the issuance of the decision in SAS, the PTO gave guidance, issued some guidance on how it will be dealing with with this new opinion. So future institutions will be all or none on, in terms of the claims. So either the, when you file a petition, all claims in that petition will be instituted or not. The, the guidance said the panel may also issue an order to institute on all um, grounds. So in the guidance, it's not clear that all grounds would be instituted. However, I have heard the Chief Chief Judge Rushke speak a couple times since then. It sounds like the, the PTAB is going to be doing all claims, all grounds from now on. And so one of the things the PTAB did after SAS is they held a webinar where Chief Judge Rushke talked. And he, he again, in that webinar, he indicated that all grounds and all claims would be instituted together or would rise and fall together, and also that the PTAB may revisit, revisit the decision to institute and maybe deny a petition that had previ previously instituted. I haven't seen that yet. Going to the next slide, this is a slide from that webinar, and it divides up the timeline that I showed previously among before the decision to institute and after the decision to institute, and the chief in that webinar where uh, the slides are available at the, the link at the bottom of the screen. The, the chief discussed what would happen with the PTAB ruling based on what part of the case your petition is in. So if it's before the decision to institute, the um, 
the decision will address all claims, all grounds. If it's after the decision but before the patent owner response, the, um, the PTAB will issue a new, new guidance on that case and it may delay the, the time when the um, patent owner response is due. And the, the chief went through all of the different categories of, of time and how the, um, the PTAB plans to address each case individually depending on where it is in this timeline. The chief also said if we, basically if the PTAB forgets your case and doesn't issue something, you should, you should file a motion asking for, for guidance and that the parties can decide to waive uh, the, the requirement that all grounds are all claims if the parties both want that. Um, and also something very interesting I thought was after the final written decision and before appeal, even if the petition for rehearing deadline had passed, you could file a request for the PTAB to give you permission to file um, a petition for rehearing based on this and they would consider extending your deadline for the petition for, I thought that was very interesting and different. Um, and so if you want more details, you can go to that website at the bottom of the page. So the impact. We think that, that SAS changes the odds for motions for stay in a district court litigation, whereas before petitioners, defendants in that litigation would file IPRs and ask for stays of the whole case even when partial institutions happen, now it's either going to be all or none. And so presumably all claims at issue in the litigation are going to be addressed by the PTAB or all claims won't be, depending on what your petition is. And so we think that this ha means that more district court judges will be interested in in allowing stays and in, in um, granting stays because the estoppel effect of the PTAB's ruling in this petition will will affect all institute claims and all so it will have more of an effect and there there won't be as much uh, chances for disparate estoppel issues based on the different claims that are instituted versus not. Jennifer, I'm curious. I know some judges have waited until institution to rule on stay motions. Do you think this increases the odds that they'll rule on it just because you filed one, because they'll get an up or down quickly? I personally don't think that it will increase the odds that you'll get a stay before institution um, because it happens quickly and if if it happens, then the judge can react quickly. And if it doesn't happen, there was no need for the judge to react at all. So I don't think it'll change the judge's minds pre-institution, but I think it will have an effect post-institution. If, if all claims in that litigation have been instituted, it, it is more of a, an incentive to, um, to stay the case. And on the other side, for the PTAB, where a petition may have had one claim that looked like it had a reasonable likelihood of success. The PTAB would have instituted on that one claim. Now there's this chance that the PTAB has to address every claim in the petition even when only one claim looks like it has a reasonable chance of success. And so there's now an incentive on the PTAB side perhaps not to institute those, those cases where there would be a lot of work for a, a small amount, of, a small number of claims that were if the PTAB, if you are addressing 20 claims and only one is interesting, that might be a case where the PTAB in its discretion decides not to institute. And from the patent owner point of view, there, because all claims and all grounds will be instituted or, or not, the patent owners might be interested in having a different strategy for patent owner responses. So whereas before if you respond, you you show your hand to the petitioner and sh and show what the problems are. Now um, you could respond and and get the P PTAB to think that this isn't case worthy of their time because it all rises and falls together perhaps. Um, but there's definitely different considerations that now have to go into the patent owner response. Um, and finally, there's this because all claims and all grounds are instituted, that will affect a patent owner's decision and strategy on amendments. I don't, we don't know yet exactly what these new institution decisions are going to look like, 
look like in mass. So if they're instituting all claims, is the patent owner going to know if um, which claims had a reasonable likelihood of success and which ones didn't? And so the amendment strategy is going to need to change, I think. Um, and even if the PTAB says we don't think that there was a reasonable likelihood of, of success on certain claims, that doesn't mean that the petitioner can't convince the PTAB that they were wrong. And so the amendment strategy also has to take that into account. Even if, even if the PTAB says there, that these claims are not strong for, um, for finding unpatentability, if, if the PTAB changes its mind in the final written decision and the patent owner doesn't have a contingent amendment, that, that's a problem for patent owners that needs to be considered. Next, I'm going to pass it back to Mike for Western GECO. So this is certainly our, our most recent case of the three that we got this term, and it's not an IPR case, so we get to talk about something other than patent review and how the patent office ought to do its thing. Western GECO versus Ion Geophysical uh, just came out, I guess, about a week ago. Uh, that one was on June 22nd. So this concerns extraterritorial damages, and of course the territory we're talking about is in the United States, the language of the statute. So what was at issue here? Well, the Federal Circuit you know, had said that lost profits arising from prohibited combinations occurring outside the U.S. are unavailable. Now, so what we're talking about here is a particular type of patent infringement. And the statute you see there, 271F, was actually passed by Congress in response to a Supreme Court case that said, well, it's not actually infringement if you take all the parts of a patented device and you ship them right outside the U.S. border and put them together there. And Congress was like, hmm, and passed 271F. And in 271F, basically, if you ship all or at least the critical components of a patented device, outside the United States for combination somewhere else, that's still an act of infringement. And the question was, well, okay, does that mean that I just get a royalty or do I actually have the chance to get my profits outside the United States on a U.S. patent? So the Supreme Court took it on. They granted certiorari. Now, this is the second time they've done that. This case, they originally granted cert and vacated and remanded to the Federal Circuit based on another case, but the Federal Circuit came back with the same result, so the Supreme Court took it on a second time. And this is our, our second time. The, the underlying dispute concerns survey devices, so it's understandable, obviously, outside the United States, we're talking about things that are used on the surface or underneath the ocean to survey the ocean floor. So, Justice Thomas as IP guru. Justice Thomas is um, the one who, interestingly enough, got this decision as well. So that's two out of our three IP decisions where he has been the writer of the majority. Um, and you know, good question why Justice Thomas has become such a prolific writer on these cases. I'm going to turn it to our expert. Aaron, why do you think he's such a prolific guy when sure. it comes to patents? I'll, always happy for a digression for some Supreme Court inside baseball. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of theories on this. One theory which has some legitimacy to it is that Justice Thomas is a very principled justice and he has a unique and, and uh, somewhat idiosyncratic approach to interpreting statutes in the Constitution that is not shared by most members of the court. Uh, and, and therefore, if he is assigned to write an opinion that uh, appears to have only five votes, he may well have trouble keeping those five votes. So that tends to push uh, his opinion assignments in the direction of technical areas that tend to have fewer closely divided decisions. Uh, Justice Thomas has also embraced this role. He's spoken publicly about the, the joy that he takes in delving into the difficult areas of IP and bankruptcy and tax. And, and developing an expertise in those areas. Uh, now, we can't always overstate this. Justice Thomas did write two very important five to four decisions this term in the Ohio versus Amex antitrust case, as well as the case involving uh, compelled speech at crisis pregnancy centers. So uh, Justice Thomas is assigned some very important and high profile cases that are close, but uh, at the same time, we should certainly keep our eyes open for him to write more and more uh, patent cases and other, other technical cases. 
As far as the dissent in this case, uh, before we, we turn to, to what the case actually said, it's worth just noting that this was a bit of an odd couple in the dissent, Justice Breyer and Justice Gorsuch, uh, two justices on opposite ends of the spectrum. And uh, this is something we also see more in patent cases, as well as other technical or, or areas of the law where the ideological divide doesn't break along the traditional lines. Uh, we saw a couple interesting lineups this term, which I always like to remind people shows the court is not just the Republican versus Democrat uh, robotic voting machine. They all have their own judicial philosophies that, it, that they apply to the particular case at hand and the different areas of law that they address. One of the biggest cases this term was Wayfair versus South Dakota, having to do with whether states can tax the remote sellers on interstate sales and the court had to address whether to overrule one of its decisions that had prevented that taxation. Uh, you see the lineup there was an opinion by Justice Kennedy, joined by Thomas, Ginsburg, Alito, and Gorsuch, holding that that previous decision should be overruled and states could impose those taxes. The chief plus three of the liberal justices dissented. There the dispute was largely about uh, stare decisis. The chief would have refused to overrule the decision and left the issue to Congress to figure out. Uh, Justice Kennedy said, we created this problem, we should fix it. So you see an area where the, the ideology doesn't necessarily split on party lines. A couple other ones just to mention in passing. Sessions versus DeMaia had to do with an immigration statute and whether it was void for vagueness. Uh, Gorsuch joined the liberals in that case and so much uh, so that uh, President Trump tweeted uh, criticism of that decision. He didn't come out and name Justice Gorsuch and say, I'm disappointed, but he did say Congress needs to fix this loophole that the Supreme Court has now created. Uh, one final one to mention, just because it was a big case this term, the Carpenter case about whether the government can collect the location of your cell phone over a long period of time without a warrant. Uh, there you had the chief joined by the four liberals saying the government does need a warrant to do that. And you had the four conservatives crying foul and, and saying uh, that's just typical collection of data that's given to a business and therefore it should be uh, able to be collected through a subpoena. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, the Sessions was also interesting because in Gorsuch, who wrote that or wrote an opinion there, actually previewed what he did in oil states because he talked about the property right in essentially your green card. So he previewed kind of a broad feeling about private property, and that one came out a ways before oil states and, and perhaps gave us a, an idea of where he was going. And let's talk about Western GECO. I mean, the Federal Circuit got reversed. Uh, so they, uh, they batted 333, which is pretty good in the major leagues, not necessarily so good in the circuit court leagues. Uh, yeah, they, the question in the case, of course, was whether the patent statute allowed the patent owner to recover lost foreign profits. And that will be an important term, I think, in applying this. The uh, Supreme Court said, yes, they do. Um, importantly, the Supreme Court looked at a specific provision, which is the 271F2. So we're getting into the weeds there, but that's a particular type of infringement, which we talked about where the components are put together outside the United States. You know, 271F deals with both that situation and the situation where a patented method is performed outside the United States, but it is performed by some sort of machine or other device that has been in the United States and is exported. But Justice Thomas was careful enough to even say, no, I'm just looking at subsection 2 of section of F. So again, a careful holding that is pretty, pretty narrow there, at least in terms of his language. Now, that doesn't mean it won't be expanded when used in the courts below. In addition to that, he also uh, continued his pattern, which we talked about in oil states, of telling us explicitly, here's what I'm not deciding. In footnote three, he told us that he does not address the extent to which other doctrines, such as proximate cause, something that the tort lawyers know well, could limit or preclude damages in particular cases. So that will probably be something taken up by all the defendants who face this sort of lost profits claim. 
that no, there's no proximate cause for those lost foreign profits, and, and we'll see some back and forth probably developing that law going forward. Finally, one big area that's probably going to be important in the application of Western GECO is whether it ends up having a role with, one, with 271B cases. That's induced infringement, where one party convinces another party or encourages them to do something that infringes the patent. And this is pretty important because a lot of times companies will have a patent where their customers are actually doing the thing that the patent talks about, but they don't want to sue their customers. They want to sue their competitors. So what they do is they sue their competitors saying, you induced your customer to do that bad thing. Well, the Federal Circuit has some law talking about how you can have extraterritorial means that induce acts of direct infringement. So the question will be, and I'm sure parties will argue, well, Western GECO tells us that infringement that includes foreign acts or impacts outside the United States can result in foreign lost profits and we can recover those. That'll be a battleground. It's, a, it's a, actually much more often do you see cases with inducement claims than the types of claims that come under 271F2. So look for those cases to be citing Western GECO or distinguishing it depending on which side you're on. So where are we? We've got Western GECO, we've got oil states, we've got SAS Institute, but we also have the cases over the last few years from the Supreme Court. Where is the Supreme Court going? Well, in general, we see the Supreme Court raising the stakes. The Supreme Court has really said in their case as well, a patentee is risking a lot by bringing their patent into the courtroom. First of all, the other side can immediately file an IPR and under SAS Institute, if that IPR gets granted, all of the claims are going to be in play. Under oil states, it's constitutional to do it the way it's being done, no jury, no court. So, you know, patentee is facing more risk than they might have faced if the Supreme Court had decided the other way. On the other hand, the Supreme Court has also raised the stakes on the other side. They've said in the last few years that there's a lower bar for getting attorney's fees. That was the Octane Fitness case. They've said there's a lower bar for getting exemplary damages. That was the HALO case. And now Western GECO is opening the door, we don't know how much, but certainly some, for lost foreign profits. So if you win, whichever side you're on, evidently you get to win big. If you lose, obviously the counter applies. So the Supreme Court has really taken what was already a high risk, high stakes game and made it higher stakes. So that's what we have this term, looking at it from the lens of the last few years. Now let's turn and look at what's coming up. Um, we have two grants, actually. One grant from the, that has already been in, came in last week, and then another one this morning. So we'll see if we have time for that, but now we have our special occasion where we get to talk about the code that you'll want to write down to make sure you have CLE credit. The code for this CLE performance is 24319. So please write that down because we're not allowed to email it to you. 24319. Nope. Thank you, Jennifer. I would have gotten in a lot of trouble if I got it wrong. 24319. All right. Thanks, everybody. And now we're going to talk about that first grant. Jennifer, can you tell us about Health and Healthcare? Yes, so this case is about what is prior art after the passage of the American Events Act. So before the American Events Act, 102, the, the statute changed, um, it, the American Events Act changed 102, what is prior art. And before AIA passed, the statute said, as you'll see at the bottom of the screen, that a person is entitled to a patent unless the invention was on sale in this country more than one year prior to the effective filing date. And the AIA changed it to say the same thing except it added this clause. Um, so the invention was on sale or otherwise available to the public. So that is the key. What does that mean? What does that change mean and what does it have to do with the definition of prior art? Helsin has, um, 
Helsin is about a secret sale. So if you um, sell something to, to somebody who is going to help you for perhaps make a ph pharmaceutical um, get through the trials and you have to sell it to them in order to get through the, the, the government's hurdles to get that approved, that is pre-AIA, that was a sale as long as it wasn't for experimental use. And post-AIA, the um, federal circuit has said it's still prior art to the patent. And in the federal circuit said this clause that was added otherwise or otherwise available to the public didn't change their pre-AIA law on what is prior art. There was nothing in the legislative history and there was nothing in the, in the plain language of the, of the statute to say that this was a change to what prior art is. And but the, um, the petitioner the, for certiorari says that they're wrong, that this basically otherwise, that word has meaning and wouldn't have been put in there unless it was meant to qualify the rest of the, um, the, the list. So they're saying on sale means it has to be on sale and, and, and as such available to the public. So a secret sale, a sale that was made under a non-disclosure agreement is not available to the public because it was secret and it should not be considered prior art. So that's what the, the Supreme Court has decided to address in Helsin and it seems like a nice Supreme Court issue because it's a textual analysis, which is something they like to do. We also think that there might be a chance that the Supreme Court will be interested in 101 issues perhaps in this next term. So Director Iancu testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee in April and, and laid out an argument that the Supreme Court has added uncertainty and that more direction is needed and that basically asked Congress to deal with 101, but what this also does is asks the Supreme Court to deal with 101 by, say, by saying that the director of the PTO is not happy with, um, with 101 law and is begging for more direction. And uh, Aaron, do you think that's something that the Supreme Court would be interested in taking up based on this um, testimony? The Supreme Court doesn't like to be criticized, <laughs> uh, but as we've learned today, they do write their opinions very narrowly. And I'm sure a lot of people probably cringed a little bit when I said Justice Thomas had acquired an expertise in patent law. I've lost a bankruptcy case in front of him. I might share your opinion on that. Uh, but Chief Justice Roberts has been very attuned to at least granting cert in patent cases. The bad old days of the 1990s when the court took one patent case every two or three terms have now morphed into three cases or more per term. And I think that's because the chief realizes how important IP is to our economy and to our judicial system. So the court is policing the federal circuit. It is interested in issues that the PTO and the federal circuit find important. So we certainly should uh, keep our eyes open for this issue. I'm sure the director will be looking for cases to tee up if, uh, to the extent that's within his control and uh, private litigants will be looking for good vehicles to further interpret uh, Section 101. And actually, uh, we, we, because it happened just this morning, we don't have a slide on it, but I do want to talk a little bit about a case in which the Supreme Court granted cert just this morning that is a copyright case. Um, so excuse the lack of slide, but uh, that case is the Fourth Estate Public Benefit Corp versus WallStreet.com. Uh, and it's a copyright law, and if anyone, you know, anyone who's tried to bring a copyright case has probably run into the issue that involves a circuit split. We're outside of patent law, so we can have circuit splits. It's very refreshing. Uh, in this situation, the question is how much you have to have with respect to having registered your copyright in order to bring a case. So there's a portion of the Copyright Act, it's 17 U.S.C. 411A that requires you to have gotten to the copyright office in some way, and the circuits have different feels about what that requires, in order to file your copyright infringement case. So on, in one corner, we have the Fifth and Ninth Circuits, 
an interesting combination. Having said that, well, if you have delivered the required application and the deposit and the fee, you're good to go. So you don't have to wait on the bureaucracy of the Copyright Office to actually get done. You can do that and go ahead and, and file your copyright case and you match the requirements of 411A. However, in the other corner, we have the Court of Appeals for the 10th and 11th circuits. So those circuits have said, no, you actually have to have the Copyright Office act on the application. Your copyright needs to be registered and that requires an actual act by the Copyright Office. Now, this used to be, frankly, a much bigger issue like 30 years ago. It's, now it's an issue of days rather than an issue of weeks or months. But it still can be very important. Often a client will have a copyright infringement that is a reputational problem or that they want to nip in the bud before it spreads in this day of viral communication on the internet. So this question of days can be really important and we're going to see where we sit. You know, a lot of companies are now registering copyrights that they see as uh, covering information that's important that they'll need to act on quickly because of the fear that the person who might be infringing would be in the 10th or 11th circuits where they have to be registered to proceed. If the Supreme Court agrees with the 5th and 9th circuits, we might see companies able to dial back the amount of copyright registration they do because they know they can put the materials together, get them to the, patent to the copyright office door, and be able to file their lawsuit. But we'll see how that one develops in the briefing and uh, get to talk about it next year and actually have a copyright case. That being said, we now move to the questions part of our panel uh, and to address anything that has been brought in. But I'm seeing that we do not have any questions. So uh, evidently, I'm glad that we covered everything folks were interested in. And thank you for attending, and I hope uh, you were instructed and entertained and found something useful in our commentary on the Supreme Court this year. We're looking forward to seeing everyone next year and letting you know what they're up to up there in D.C. in June of 2019. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.